The weight of the world is on your shoulders and you can feel the suffering of the collective unconscious deep inside your soul. So it's no surprise that no matter what you do, no matter what you try, you know that it's your job to try and alleviate some of the burden of mankind. Have you tapped into divine inspiration and now you're a humanitarian visionary? Or are you a bit of a grandiose, self-inflated, up-your-own-rear-end kind of individual who needs a lesson in resolving childhood trauma and the grandiose response to chaos? That's the question that we're exploring in today's video. We'll be going into these books and another book in response to this question on whether or not I believe it is the responsibility of the individual to advance the collective unconscious. Simple answer. Yes. Complex and more truthful answer, probably not and potentially no. Let's begin with some definitions and some perspective framing because we can't understand what the collective unconscious is unless we understand the personal unconscious because you need to understand the individual before you can understand the group. And fortunately, I have this wonderful book, The Primal Wound, hopefully that comes up on the screen, by John Furman and Anne Giller, which has this wonderful diagram of the multiple layers of the unconscious, which I'm going to briefly hold up and then turn into this little egg. I hope you can see this on the camera. I'm going to massively simplify this for the sake of a 30 second introduction to the unconscious. I've done this in a previ previous video on psychosynthesis. Here we go. Hopefully you can see this. This dot represents your ego or your sense of self. These arrows represent your perception, your field of awareness, and this middle band between the two elastic bands on the egg, which represents the entirety of you, is the middle unconscious. This is material which is potentially in reach of your awareness, and it's not quite repressed, which are these bands. You've got the lower unconscious, that's repressed, darker primal energy, and you've got the higher unconscious, which is all of that golden shadow potential. I'm not going to go into it in too much depth. What I want you to focus on is how small that little dot is right in the middle and just how much more of the unconscious surrounds your central sense of self. Gradually, as you go through the individuation process, you will lift these bands up or push them down and you will reclaim territory from your personal unconscious. This is the whole point of this channel and the point of healing, to put it simply. That's you as an individual. Times this by 8 billion, 9 billion, 10 billion, however many people are going to exist on this earth during your lifetime, is it realistically your responsibility to advance the collective unconscious, which represents the middle collective unconscious, the lower collective unconscious, and the upper collective unconscious as just the single person that you are? In a technical sense, yes, you're a human in humanity, therefore any change that you make, the agency and free will that you have in the world, will have downstream effects which will, technically, influence the collective unconscious. But the challenge is that these ideas often get rapidly swept up into grandiose and rather self-inflated messiah complex territory where you somehow disproportionately take on the burdens of collective trauma. And we're going to go into a book which I held up just at the start. Let's make sure that egg is not going to shatter, otherwise we have completely dissolved our personal boundaries and then we've returned back to source nature, whatever you believe that might be. Bringing out a little quote here from this book, I uh, held it up a moment ago, Healing Collective Trauma by Thomas Hubel. And the reason I want to bring this quote forwards is just to clarify how immense the task would be to actually make a sizable impact on collective trauma. Because when people are saying, I'm here to help with the collective unconscious, generally the sub-conversation is, I believe I've got something valuable to offer and alleviate the pain of the world. There's a messiah complex which is baked into that conversation, Maybe not at the surface level, maybe not at the topsoil level, but at a deeper, unconscious, again, maybe subconscious actually, because unconscious is a different word, 
the subconscious implication of that kind of thinking is that you're here to make a difference and you are but let's make sure you know what you're actually coming up against because it's not as simple as uh as things might appear on first impact so i'm gonna read the quote everything that resides in my unconscious inevitably flows into and blends with yours and everyone else's Altogether, this forms the collective shadow, which may be visualized as a series of dark subterranean lakes flowing deep beneath our everyday awareness. The dark water of the collective shadow becomes a way station for the energetic residue of unresolved conflicts, multi-generational suffering, and all manner of unhealed trauma. It's not a pretty picture. It harbors the unacknowledged hatred of one nation for another, the suppressed terror echoing within a racial group or gender, and the unexpressed outrage felt by a tribe or religious faction. Final sentence. Psychic energy that is held in the shadow remains out of sight until it becomes activated by external conditions and an accumulation of energetic momentum within the social field. If you're interested in these ideas, I recommend that you pick up this book for yourself, Healing Collective Trauma by Thomas Hubel. My eyes seem to be catching the attention. Nonetheless, you can listen to my words, and that's the book. It's a pretty good book. It's not maybe the most useful book in regards to deeper psychological studies, but if you identify with wanting to help, go into the book yourself. The picture's not very pretty, is it? multi-generational suffering and the terrors of humankind stacked upon history after history after history of abuses and terrors. It would be a noble man or woman who wants to contribute to this, and I would say that at the deeper philosophical or highest philosophical perspective, every action that we take will have string-like effects into the world around us, and we will literally impact the collective unconscious. As we reclaim our personal unconscious by venturing towards the light and going into the shadows, simply said, we are playing our part as one human amongst billions who's wrestling back some of the territory of trauma, the darkening of our soul, the dismissal and disavowal of parts of ourselves which could be very beautiful if we learn how to harness them with power and with consciousness. Anger can become assertion, which can become the directive towards change. Shame and toxic guilt can heal towards a reverence of privacy and the ability to hold boundaries where shame is an appropriate feeling at the higher, healthier level for something which should be kept private and sacred. Whole conversation in itself, we get to explore these many different undercurrents. But, but crucially, as the single invitation for this video, I don't want you to take all of this on as your responsibility, because it's not your responsibility. Ultimately, it's everyone's responsibility, and you have to be careful what you actually are looking for within that wide range of all possible experience called the collective unconscious. Let's draw a quote from The Discovery of the Unconscious by Henry Ellenberger. This 800-page behemoth of an exploration charts well, the historical psychological exploration of the unconscious from about the mid-1850s with mesmerism and hypnotism, all the way through the first dynamic psychiatries with Freud, Jung, and Adler, and moving towards about the end of the Second World War. It is a highly readable, although it may not look that way, it's a highly readable fat stack book, which I truly recommend for anyone who wants a proper education in these kinds of themes. I will bring out a quote right towards the end from the conclusion, which is pertinent to our conversation. From page 891, heavily highlighted book, let's remember what we're looking at. The wide divergences between Freud's and Jung's concept of the unconscious may be related to the fact that they did not deal with the same type of patients. This is something which is so overlooked that I cannot believe we're not talking about it. Every therapist, every experimenter, every investigator is always looking in a limited direction. Therefore, the class of the clientele, the gender of the clientele, the challenges of the clientele will indicate and inform and ultimately constrain the theory 
of the individual therapist or researcher. What I mean by this is that you need to look deeper into the definitions of the unconscious from each of the people who you are learning from. Typically, we draw more upon Jung than Freud right now, but let me continue with the quote. Freud, who worked with neurotic, who worked with neurotic, Interesting, that's a bit of a typo, it should be neurotics. Freud, who worked with neurotics and had not much experience of psychosis, came upon the unconscious of repressed drives and memories. But Jung, who worked for nine years with severe schizophrenics, was bound to find the collective unconscious and the archetypes. I can't go into too much detail about it, but hopefully that opens a bit of an intuitive awareness in your mind that what you're looking at in regards to the collective unconscious can only ever be informed by your own personal unconscious. When I'm personally looking into that collective theme, I am not seeing issues related to things which I just do not have access to. So what's an example of something which is so outside of my awareness? A culture that I don't even know exists. Let's say a culture in Africa with a rich tradition and a rich lineage and a certain type of problem related to a certain type of theme that has hundreds of years of legacy, that is completely outside of my awareness. But I might project that I have an understanding of the collective unconscious based on a limited and often distorted overlay of something that I might personally be suffering from. So let's say, for example, I was a person who'd gone through an experience of abuse in a relationship. If I haven't gone into my own personal unconscious, and claimed back that territory through the healing process in regards to my boundaries, my self-care, my self-compassion, my self-respect. If I hadn't done all of that work, I would go into every room that I enter and see the collective unconscious, but really I'm just looking in a very blurry mirror of my own personal unconscious. And this is a crucial point for the video. I invite you to stop even caring about the collective unconscious, because to some degree, you can never see it clearly. If Freud couldn't see it clearly, and if Jung can see it clearly, realistically, unless you are manically, grandiosely inflated, you're not going to see it clearly either. We can only ever see the segment which is most relevant to us. Therefore, you won't see the full picture. And this is quite liberating when you really let it land in your heart because it takes away that feeling of responsibility or that feeling of inflation that you are the world saviour and your feeling of wanting to save yourself is being disproportionately and immaturely projected into a mass of people who realistically you're not meant to help, impact or even communicate with. There will be millions, billions of people over the course of your life who are living parallel lives with parallel traumas and parallel problems that you will not be in contact with. So don't worry about it. Focus on you, because ultimately you focusing on your personal healing path will technically impact the collective unconscious, but you don't need to take on all of the burden way too quickly or even at the more local level. Don't take on the burdens of a community if you aren't strong enough and resilient enough to heal your own burdens. I started this video with the kind of comedic, theatrical, boulder on my shoulder uh, analogy. And I often relate to this at a symbolic level because I feel the weight of the world quite often. From a bioenergetic perspective, I will get tension around here and particularly in my upper traps. I don't know genetically if there's some correlation to the fact that I build muscle really easily on my shoulders and I have pretty good trap insertions? Is that some kind of a correlation towards me being the world saviour who will take the weight of the world and turn it into something healing and beautiful and we skip through a field of daisies? I don't think so. I think wrapping yourself up in those kinds of narratives is a little bit, or realistically, quite juvenile. You're not taking responsibility for that which you are capable to take responsibility for. Responsibility, your ability to respond, and that's your own personal sphere. We can't go beyond our own reach, but there is a bit of a spiritual complexity which I want to wrap this video up on, and that means I need to bring up the question in full. 
I only showed the first sentence, it's actually a much more sophisticated expansion from Bryce, which I feel go worth going into, so let me bring it up and read it out for you. Bryce asked again, Do you think that the main task of a person is to advance the collective unconscious? And do you believe that the collective unconscious can be altered and advanced by being in an isolated state and not actively making an effort to help other people? Because separateness is an illusion and we are all indeed one consciousness. For the purposes of tax and capitalism, we are separate, but if you pull back a veil, then we are one. And it stands to reason that you can advance the collective unconscious by just doing inner work and not externalizing it. I definitely agree that helping out other people and living out a life of service is the better path to take than isolation, but I do believe that both can still have a profound impact on the collective unconscious. It's just a question on which pathway you would like to take, in my honest opinion. Both serve a higher purpose. Bryce, thank you for the question. Really a nice extra layer there. I do have issue with the idea that for the purposes of tax and capitalism, that's why we're separate, because although that may be true, it is also entirely untrue. We don't want to rush too quickly towards non-duality as human beings who are still working out our own sense of personal boundaries. This is the mistake. Let me pick up the egg again. For people who haven't done their own trauma work, they will try and resolve the tensions in the upper and lower bands of their own fragmentation by potentially bypassing towards a premature connection with other people in the guise of non-duality. But what you're really doing is your it's such a complex thing to try and explain, hopefully you can bear this. What's happening in these conversations around non-duality, and you'll see it in spiritual circles, when you can become an advanced meditator, you can meditate for three or four hours and be deeply enmeshed in your non-dualistic vision of uh, ultimate spiritual enlightenment, but you're still a very aggressive person or a very disagreeable person with maybe a massive addiction to opioids or a real food addiction. You've bypassed a certain personal trauma to lock yourself into the technically correct, universally blissful love experience of God's aid in your heart but you haven't actually resolved the issue which is in your control. The non-dualistic trap, although it is, I would say, from having read philosophy and religious studies, arguably God is one and there is nothing but God. God is the circle that um, the circle whose circumference is everywhere and center is nowhere. That classic quote. There's a lot of religious depth to this idea of being one and us all being brothers and sisters finding our way towards source but we can't skip the stage of duality because this is a dualistic experience that we're having. We have men and women so that we can understand what it means to be a man or a woman and create partnerships and connections and learning experiences where we get to benefit from that process and that exploration. We have birth and death. We have individual identities. We go from unhealthy egoic defenses to wonderfully mature and healthy egos and healthy personas that can fulfill roles in the world. If we go too quickly towards non-dualistic, let's blend with the collective unconscious, we end up in pretty classically predictable schizophrenic territory. And I don't want that for you. I don't want you to be blown wide open towards imaginings, or maybe let's give a little bit of string, maybe even very real contact with certain very subtle energies or thought forms, or even entities. I don't know personally. People have a whole wide variety of beliefs about things like possession, or entities, or thought forms, or etheric fields. That's all for you to come to your own conclusions about. What I want you to have before you go into that space is a robust and solid sense of your personal identity as grounded in your two feet, in this space that you're in, in this moment that you're in, before you take yourself one step forwards, or one step backwards, or start idly and absent-mindedly exploring in the stars, and you lose your ability to process through a grounded state of mature self-connection. You won't lose the ability to tap into the collective unconscious, but your ability to do that will be significantly hindered, and arguably you'll be led down many false paths if you don't know what it means to be an individual first. 
the Messiah complex can only ever really be sustained by somebody who's disconnected from their own authenticity. Because someone who's truly in contact, and I mean, I'm still holding this egg, someone who's really in contact with this sense of I, and over the course of 10 years, they expand this circle just a little bit, and they claim back a little bit of territory here, and a little bit of territory here. They've explored the collective unconscious via their own interiority in a way that, because I've done this myself, I can help clients based on their private internal complex challenges in a way that they're often shocked that I can do this. You can empathically attune towards someone's private individual experience, which literally is tapping into a collective. At what point does it become collective? Maybe from the point where it goes from one to two and it becomes dualistic. The dualism defines the collectivity. So don't rush towards non-duality because you lose the experience of relationship. Duality is what allows for relationship between two human beings. The reason that I'm called Jordan and that you have your name is so, is so you can refer to me as Jordan. And if we have a positive relationship where you're um, fond of me and we get along well, you get to experience those emotions of being in a connection, being in a friendship, and I get to experience it for you in return. We can connect, and this is an experience that people will go through when they get into very deep spiritual states or couples who come together and get into very deep, intimate exchanges in the bedroom, there are those glimpses of non-duality. But we're always dropped back into our own identity, and I would truly suggest that that's the place you should focus, because by focusing on the individual path, you will also reveal the many roads into the collective. A wonderfully wide-ranging conversation here. Once more, I recommend that you pick these books up for yourself, I don't want this to be a 40 minute lecture that gets a bit too convoluted, but at the very least, find yourself an egg, realize that the egg is you, and don't try and put your finger into everybody else's yoke, because if you're truly trying to contribute to the collective unconscious, I will swap metaphors right now. This elastic band has just come off, let's do it this way. This is very silly. I want you to imagine that you're in a 100 person orchestra, and this is the most profound orchestra that has ever been and ever will be. There is a nine minute song which represents the song of humanity and you have your part to play and you are the elastic band player. This is the sound. Beautiful, right? Harmonious, soul shatteringly, um, just angelic, right? I, I'll cry if I do it again. Your role is to play the one note at the right time. It's not to do everything. You can't also be the piano player, the, vi the, violin the violinist, and the guitar player and the drummer. You get the point. You can't play all the instruments. You're not meant to play all the instruments. And if you're there doing that and overexerting the whole time and thinking that that's making a contribution, you're gravely mistaken. Choosing the right time to play your note and doing it collectively, but also focusing on your individual role. Bit of a strange metaphor, kind of silly, but it's been a very serious video. And if all you take from this is that you are an elastic band player and don't try and be every instrument at once, I've done my job. I'm glad that you stuck around for this video because this represents some of the issues of trying to talk to very complex and multi-layered issues at multiple levels. It's a real video. I don't edit these things because I like it to be warm, nonetheless. I'll see you over on the next video because God knows that this one is finished and that one is just about to begin. I'll see you over there.